Hey hey, welcome back to Musings of Maverick, I'm your host Maverick, and today we're going to be watching Dororo episode 8. So I am continuing on my quest uh, to catch up to the current episode, I, including this one, I got 6 episodes to go, and but I do think that I will catch up before next week drops. Although I might not be able to do next week's due to some other issues, but that's for another time. Anyways, uh, throughout the first six episodes, uh, Yakimaru basically had a pretty rough, uh, rough start. Right, he had a pretty rough life. Um, even after all these years, and now that he's grown up, um, we can still see him suffering from lots of different kinds of things. Right, suffering the loss of friends, suffering the loss of maybe even loved ones, suffering the loss of his bodily parts, although he did grow, grow them in the end. And last episode was a nice change of pace, right? For the first time, nobody was really hurt or... Okay, maybe not hurt, but uh, they, they were hurt, but nobody actually died. And it was a overall happy ending. And I guess the moral of the story of the last episode was that even monsters can have uh, their redeeming qualities. You don't need to kill every monster on sight. So, in this one, I'm expecting, or actually throughout the uh, the remaining of the episodes, I expect that we'll be seeing some more of these, you know, uh, monster of the week, and then a moral that comes out of the story uh, before we hit a actual big arc. So, um, not really much to say here. Let's just get into the episode and see what's the story this time. So let's begin in three, two, one, play. Alrighty. Mm hmm. Storm is brewing. Weren't they in like a drought? I believe. Like this country, this nation. This is just a flash storm, and then suddenly. What? Ashrain? Prepare a bride. Alright, so it's one of those sacrifice kind of things. You gotta sacrifice something to the demons. Holy air pollution. A forsaken cloud. Oh, all right. Opening here. Uh, let me just skip this real quick, and I'll see you guys in a second. All right, and we're back. The story of Saru. Sulfur, so this is a volcanic area. And I'm guessing that's why there's this ash rain and whatnot. <laughs> oh, so this is the bride to be sacrificed. Again, since this is an older work, okay, I'm guessing that this guy wants to stop this. Oh, it's his, it's his sister. All right. Mm -hmm. 
What is with his accent? I'm not really sure what that accent is. But it's definitely not normal Japanese. Okay, as I was uh, about to say, since this is a more older work, right, it's one of the OG works, uh, a lot of the cliches that are used in these kinds of monster stories, uh, it's bound to have them, right? Like this story of um, offering a bride sacrifice to monsters, uh, it's cliche as heck, right? <laughs> but still, let's see how it turns out. There's a few ways this can go. I don't think it's going to be just as straightforward as they're actually being a monster trying to eat up the bride, right? Somehow I feel like there's going to be a twist. <laughs> Maggots. Well, you are starving, aren't you? Really? Is that actually gold or is that fool's gold? I wonder what he sees in regards to the black clouds. She probably doesn't want to be saved, though, right? <laughs> Have you guys ever thought about Moving? Oh, here we go. You guys might want to scram. Oh. Is something going to come back down? Nope. Oh. Alright. Come on, he has better senses than you do. Oh, so the Black Fang is entirely evil. Alright. Huh. Okay. The sort of centipede? Okay. 
Okay, he probably has to learn to use his ears this time. Oh, there's a light now. What? What? Yeah, but his sister. I thought he would have, like, start blaming them. Now, this guy's also speaking with a sort of interesting accent, but I'm not really sure what the accent is. No name. So you'll be called Saru. How do you even know how to speak then? <laughs> He really does look like a monkey, I gotta say. <laughs> is he actually sulking? Oh, or is he actually... No, wait. I believe he's trying to train his sense of hearing. Some sonar abilities. That's going to be my guess. That's why he's tossing the rocks, so that he can listen to the uh, the waves, the sound waves. But it was fun to think of him as sulking at that moment. And how do you know? Yeah, he's definitely training his hearing. You ain't fooling me, Yakimaru!
I guess I have to. All right. Round two. You've got some guts, Doro. Okay. What can the two of them do? Oh, okay. Okay, that's smart. Igniting a sulfur. That blows away the, the explosion, blows away the clouds. Oh. Dang. Now it's pissed. Oh, see, there's Hyakimaru. Oh, you're using a bow too? Aim for his eyes. Oh, what? That's it? So he repeatedly attacked the same part, the same place. What? <laughs> you are reckless as heck! There we go. Nice. Wait, what? Okay, slashing from the inside? All right. Yeah, I should have saw that one coming. And how are you gonna survive the fall? Now that was convenient. <laughs> All right. Oh, 
Oh. So Big Sis wasn't completely digested yet? Okay, so what is he gaining now? A nose? Okay. <laughs> and so your first smell is sulfur. Alright. Got a flower. Oh, good for you. <gasps> he just said my name. <laughs> Aww. Want to teach him how to say his name? Alright. I think there might be a little bit more after this. Uh, I'll skip ahead and check, and if there is, I'll get back to you guys. If not, we'll just meet in the discussion part. So, see you guys in a second. And that was episode 8 of Dororo. Now, to be honest, there's not really that much to talk about this episode. It's fairly straightforward, so I thought I'd like to give a little bit of trivia in regards to the monster of this series, of this episode. You know, the big centipede-looking dude, right? Well, it is a centipede, essentially. So, as I mentioned within the episode, this kind of story setting is actually quite cliché. It's been used in a lot of works, and that's because it's based on Japanese folklore. So, of course, with these kinds of reference materials, uh, authors would put it into their, their works as a sort of reference, as a sort of basis for their stories. Now, some people might look at this case of, okay, sacrificing a bride or something to the monster and instantly think of the famous monster Yamato no Orochi, uh, which is, you know, literally the bi the eight-headed snake. I'm sure lots of you guys would have seen references to this somewhere in other uh, works as well. And, uh, you know, it, it could be based on that, but I think it would probably be even more accurate to say it's based on the actual centipede monster, the Oomukate. So this one uh, also has its own folklore attached to it, and probably the most famous of them re uh, pertains to a certain character named Fujiwara no Hidesato. So this character, Fujiwara, is actually an aristocrat slash general during the Heian Jidai, the Heian period of Japanese history. So that's about uh, 10th century, uh, give or take, so about 900 something AD. Uh, so this this guy was basically a general, right? So he's, he's a big, um, he's just a person of the court. And so the story goes that one day, well, I'm not going to tell the entire story here. To cut the long story short, uh, one day as he was walking around and he happened to come across some descendants of the Dragon King. And so the descendants of the Dragon King enlisted his... And by the way, it's a, it's a woman, right? So then this woman uh, enlisted his help in trying to slay this, uh, this Omukade, this 
giant centipede monster that was, you know, giving some trouble to them. Uh, and, you know, it's making base at a mountain and then it's it's troubling everybody, right? So uh, she enlisted the help of Fujiwara to help slay it. And so Fujiwara obliges and goes up to try and slay this monster with sword and arrows. So this monster, the Oomukade, is huge, right? Apparently, according to folklore, it's big enough to wrap around a mountain seven and a half times. So uh, compared to the monster in Dororo, uh, is it? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, right? But anyways... Um, so they fight a while, and then eventually Fujiwara does slay the monster, although he slayed it by, uh, he finished it by using an arrow, bow and arrow. So, then the dude is rewarded by, by bringing him to the Dragon Palace, and then also earning the praise of the Dragon King, and so it's, eventually this also ties in with, uh, some of his exploits, further exploits on the battlefield and whatnot in actual Japanese history. At least that is how the folklore goes and how it pertains to this actual character from Japanese history and how he gained his powers, etc, etc. So I'm guessing that this probably is based on this story of Fujiwara and his slaying of the Omukade. So just a little bit of trivia for you guys. Um, in regards to the actual episode itself, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of lukewarm on this one. Uh, it's not it's it's just okay for me, right? There's nothing particularly compelling about this certain episode. No new morals were given. I guess in the end, Dor I mean, Hyakimaru got his nose back. Hooray. Um, and, you know, that that's basically it, right? So nothing much else to talk about here. Uh, I do find it kind of funny, however, why the monster would want to gain brides as sacrifices like that doesn't really make sense does it actually have a conscience or something uh, is it sentient um, but then again in the episode they already said it doesn't matter it's a monster so I'm guessing probably there's not there's nothing that I need to look further it's not you know deeper than I'm than uh, it's making out to be so uh, just a fairly straightforward episode so that's that. Let's just move on forward to the next one, and I will be continuing to watch this. So hopefully I'll see you guys in episode 9. So until then, bye-bye.